so we have the definition of a matrix. We can write it out a little, or uh, orthogonal matrix. We can write this very easily as A inverse equals A transpose. So that's uh, a faster way to write orthogonal. And what do we get if we multiply A by A inverse? The identity. We get the identity. And now I'm just going to substitute out A inverse by A transpose. And they're equal. So A times A transpose is the identity. And of course, you can multiply the other order, meaning A inverse times A. You still get the identity. And that will be A transpose A. So again, it doesn't mean matrices commute, just means these particular two matrices, you get the identity if you multiply them either order. All right, so we're going to uh, check or uh, if a matrix is orthogonal. So we're gonna have to use fractions here. So a lot of these matrices are going to have fractions in them. So we have three sevenths, I'm going to go across row one, three sevenths, two sevenths, six sevenths. Row two is negative six sevenths, three sevenths, two sevenths. Two sevenths, six sevenths, negative three sevenths. All right, it's way faster to transpose a matrix than it is to invert it. So what we're going to do is transpose it and then multiply it by A. And if we get the identity, the only way we get that is if it's actually also the inverse. So I could compute the inverse, but I think that takes too long. So we're going to basically check by doing the computation I put in the box right there. So that's going to be the fast way to do it. So that's what we're going to be doing. All right, so first thing we're going to do is transpose it. Now when you transpose, I'll use the highlighter here. The diagonal stays where it is, and then you're going to reflect everything above the diagonal goes below the diagonal. Is this example asking if it's orthogonal? Oh yeah, so is a <laughs> orthogonal. Now this is a different definition than orthogonal for vectors. That was if their dot product was zero. So here we're multiplying, but we're not doing a dot product, and it's not zero. It's the identity. So again, same word means something very different right here. So I always find these a little bit tricky to do. So the reason I put that yellow line in there, that symmetry line, is because, for me at least, it's easier to see that these two that I have in green, they're going to be <coughs> trading places. So it's pretty easy to see the two sevenths and the six sevenths are going to swap because they're at the corners. But the other two, if you're not all the way at a corner, it's a little tricky to see where you go. So what I wouldn't want to do is swap that six sevenths at the bottom up for the two sevens, for example. That's a mistake I could definitely see making. So that's why I draw the line uh, down the diagonal. Okay, so just multiply A and A transpose. And it shouldn't matter the order. I'll do A transpose A. All right, so first of all, who likes fractions? So how can I get fractions out of here? So I'm gonna factor out one seventh, and then uh, I'm just left with all the integer 
numerators basically. So we got 3, negative 6, 2, 2, 3, 6, 6, 2, negative 3. So that is A transpose. I'm going to do the same thing for A, but I'll do it right in line here. So it's A transpose, and then A, I'm going to do the same thing, bring that 1 7 out. So I got 3, 2, 6. Negative 6, 3, 2, 2, 6, negative 3. So any questions on that, getting those uh, fractions out. Now I can commute scalars, so I can bring the sevenths together as 1 49th, or 1 7 squared. And now I'm just multiplying the two integer matrices. So any questions on that right there? Now you notice the same numbers showed up again and again, just different signs on them basically. Uh, I don't think that will always be the case, but I think that does happen quite a bit. So we're going to look at uh, ref rotation and reflection matrices now. We'll do a rotation matrices first. We're going to rotate about the origin by theta, and we're going to be in R2 here. So rotation matrix is cos theta, negative sine theta, sine theta, cos theta. So let's pick a nice theta value. 
I think pi is a little too easy. Maybe pi over 4 I think would be pretty reasonable without giving us too hard. Well, pi over 4 gives us really nice numbers. Yeah, we'll just do pi over 4. No, we'll do pi over 2. That gives us way nicer numbers. So if we have a vector right here, we'll call it v. If I rotate, I'm going to let theta equal pi over 2. So I want to rotate. That'll be one quarter rotation counterclockwise. So here is v rotated right there by pi over 2. And the way we do this, we're going to multiply v by the matrix A, where we're using pi over uh, 2. So I'm just filling in pi over 2 for all of these. So we got cos pi over 2, negative sine pi over 2, sine pi over 2, cos pi over 2. This is our first, I think this is our first time we're using trigonometry in this class. Getting fancy, all right. So cos pi over 2 is 0, sine pi over 2 is 1. So it's a negative sine pi over 2, negative 1. Positive one, zero. All right, so this matrix should rotate our vector V. Now I didn't write down coordinates for V, but what seems like some reasonable coordinates for me to fill in for V here? Three, one maybe? Sound reasonable? Looks pretty close to what it is. Maybe 2, 3, but we'll just go with 3, 1. So V is going to be 3, 1. What should the coordinates of A, V equal, the rotated version? So, yeah, so we're going to go, so it should be our old y coordinate, it's a little weird, it's going to become our negative x coordinate. So our new x coordinate should be negative 1, and then our new y coordinate will be positive 3. So it looks like when we rotate, we should get negative 1, 3 on this vector here. All right, let's test it out. We're going to multiply v by this matrix right here. So we got 3, 1 times A. So that is negative 1 and 3. All right, so that does indeed take that one vector and rotate it. So we've seen that a linear transformation is determined by what it does to basis vectors. So how many vectors do I need to make a basis in R2? Two. Two. I already have one vector that's not zero. So pick any other vector that's not parallel to V. There's some easy ones, 0, 1, or 1, 0 are the easiest ones to pick. But you can pick any other vector you want and see what A does to it. And then make sure that it actually rotates it a quarter rotation the correct direction. So pick any other vector that's not parallel and see what it does. Make sure that it actually rotates. And I would pick an easy one. So whatever easy vector you want. go negative one zero but you can choose any vector you want
So I got the wrong thing, but I also made a mistake. What did I do wrong? So this acts like a, no, this actually was a counterclockwise rotation, but I didn't put in W, I put in, I filled in AW's coordinates right here, not W, so it wouldn't match. However, if I rotate AW, I get the unit vector going directly to the right, which is what my calculations are right there. All right, so that was what we were expecting. All right, all you have to do is just check any basis you want. And then if it does what you're thinking it should do to the basis, it'll do it to all the vectors in the space. So if it rotates your basis vector, it's gonna rotate the whole space. All right, so that's a rotation matrix. So what we're gonna do is show that any rotation matrix in R2 is orthogonal. I will put one question on your final that is prove something. I think this would be a reasonable, I'm not gonna put this exact question on it because we're doing it right now, but this would be a reasonable question to put on your final, is pr prove any rotation matrix is orthogonal. All right, so a rotation matrix is the form that's in the upper left corner. So step one is find the transpose, and then step two, multiply, and hopefully get the identity. So this one's pretty easy to transpose. I'll just put my little symmetry line down the diagonal. You're just changing the two elements off the diagonal. All right, so multiply all these out. And it looks like you're gonna have some cosine squared and sine squareds. What identity will be useful from trigonometry class? Cos squared, uh, so cos squared plus sine squared equals one. So that will be handy here. All right, so multiply these out like you usually do. and then use your trig skills to reduce this matrix down, hopefully to the identity. It certainly won't look like the identity when you first multiply, it's gonna be big and ugly.
All right, so we got the identity. Now all the sines and cosines disappeared, so it didn't matter what value we chose for theta. It was to work for all theta values. So we'll write down our next theorem. The inverse of an orthogonal matrix. So if we think about the inverse of an orthogonal matrix, will that be orthogonal? Let's go back up for a second for the most important thing. So if the inverse is the transpose of the original matrix, then the inverse, the inverse inverse will be the transpose transpose. So the inverse or the transpose of an orthogonal matrix will also be orthogonal because you can just apply an inverse transpose again. So that's our first part of that theorem. So the inverse of an orthogonal matrix, matrix is orthogonal. Now, of course, the inverse is the transpose. So I can also write the transpose of an orthogonal matrix is orthogonal because that's the exact same thing as the inverse. The product of orthogonal matrices is orthogonal. If A is orthogonal, so if A is orthogonal, then determinant of A equals 1 or determinant of A equals negative 1. All right, so our projector went out again, I know. So we have the theorem written down. We're going to now prove this. So I think the first part was obvious, too obvious to even prove. So we're going to prove the second part. And I'll just talk, and you can write. And hopefully you'll be able to hear me over the fan. So we're going to work on the proof right now. So <clears throat> I want the product of two orthogonal matrices. I want to show that that's orthogonal. So we're going to start with our supposition. So we're going to suppose the matrices A and B are orthogonal. So that's our supposition. So write down what that means for A and B. And I'm using capital A and capital B. So write down what that means. So that means A inverse equals A transpose and B inverse equals B transpose. So those are both going on. And now we're about to write down what we're supposed to prove. All right, so I'm supposed to show the product is orthogonal. So that means I'm supposed to show AB, the product AB, its inverse is equal to AB transpose. And now I have to enforce the order with parentheses. So now you can see how well you take notes when you can't see what to write. How close are your notes to what I wrote? <laughs> Pretty good. All right, so prove this right now. So we don't know that this is true, so I'll put it in a little cloud right here. So I recommend, let's start with AB inverse, and then do some work 
and hopefully get down to A, B, transpose. So my first step I wrote down is very wrong. So when you inverse, you switch order. So it'll be B inverse, A inverse. So I'll write some uh, properties over here. These are algebra properties. So A, B inverse is B inverse A, and that's of course when they exist, but we know A and B inverses exist. Did I talk about A, B product transpose? If I did or not, I forget which order this goes in. I think it switches the order also, but this is going to be true. So whatever one makes it true is the one that it is. So it's either A transpose B. Tra I think it's B. Oh, no, it's yeah. got to go B T A T because the oh, somebody's got the epic cheat sheet. All right, there we go. So it does switch the order just like the inverse. It's a good cheat sheet right there. Near rewriting. So we got B inverse, A inverse, which is B transpose. So this is where our supposition came in that the inverse is the transpose. So I just used the supposition right there to take out the inverse and replace by a transpose. And now we're going to switch the order and take the transpose out. So it's AB transpose, and that is exactly what we were supposed to show right there. There's other algebraic properties, but those are the only ones we needed for, for this proof right here. All right, so whenever I do a proof, I write down my hypothesis, what I'm supposing. And then I write down what I'm going to show, and I usually separate it with some type of circle or cloud or something like that, and then do the algebra I need to work from my assumption to the conclusion. So now we're going to prove the, uh, the next part. <coughs> so that was, if I label these with one, two, and three, So that was proof of part two. Now we're going to prove part three. So we have, we're going to suppose suppose A is orthogonal. So I want you to prove this one. So you need to show that determinant is plus or minus one. So I'm gonna quickly scroll up to all those equivalent uh, algebraic definitions of orthogonal. So not just the first one, but also the other, all these are true for the matrix A. So use these to show your determinant has to be one or negative one. And there is one more algebraic property you need of the determinant. And your determinant splits across multiplication, like this. So determinant of AB is determinant A times determinant B. So you will need that property as well.
So what's the determinant of the identity matrix? One. one. So one way to think about that, it has zeros in the lower triangle, so you can go right down the diagonal and multiply all the ones together. So that determinant is one. There's still one more property I need, another algebraic property of determinant. Anybody have on their cheat sheet the determinant of A inverse? All right, so let's say you're taking a test and you don't know the determinant of A inverse. Maybe it's maybe one over determinant of A, but you're not sure. So what I'm gonna do is look at A, A inverse determinant. That's the same as determinant of i. Determinant of i is 1. And now I'm going to solve for determinant of a inverse. So right there, in 10 seconds, I can show that the inverse determinant is the reciprocal of the regular determinant. So we'll use that property. So the inverse term is one over determinant of A. So we got one equals However, that doesn't really tell me very much information right there at all. All I know is of course the term of A divided by itself is one. So I don't think the inverse is gonna help us here. How about transposes and determinants? So let's think about transposes and determinants. It's the same determinant, right? It'll be the same determinant. Because you're basically doing, instead of spanning across a row, you're gonna go across a column. So transposing does not change your determinant. And remember, only square matrices have determinants, so you transpose a square matrix, you get a square matrix. So it's not going to mean that we can't get a determinant. So now that we have this property, A transposes A determinant, let's use that uh, transpose instead of the inverse here. So I'm going to take all these A inverses out and replace them by the transpose. So we saw that A transpose determinant is equal to just regular A determinant. And now it's an easy algebra problem. Square root both sides. So determinant is plus or minus one. There we go. Here's a really funny math notation. Technically this would be correct notation. The absolute value to the determinant equals one, but if you write absolute value next to the determinant, <laughs> yes, we know it's correct, but it looks very silly. So we'll just stick with the plus minus in this case. All right, let's end on a math notation joke. Call it a class. All right, so that's how you prove things. Start with assumptions and get to your conclusion.